What's up, everybody? I wanted to come on and do a video about a couple of things. Um, had a client about a week ago ask me uh, about the difference between pro and amateur shows, how to turn pro, that sort of thing. So I told her I would do a video on here. So I'm going to wrap that into this one with um, you know some training things that I want to talk about as well. So to get started, um, I want to talk about amateur shows, pro shows, how to turn pro, that kind of thing. So first of all, um, you have what's called a regional level show. Um, there's two different types of those. There's pro or, uh, national qualifiers and just not national qualifiers. Um, the difference is if you place top two in your class at a national qualifier, uh, that qualifies you to go to nationals. Um, and if you do a, a show that's not a national qualifier, um, it doesn't qualify you for anything, even if you win the whole show. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't do those shows. Um, that's just, you know, depends on what your goals are and where you're at uh, you know, in your career and that sort of thing. Um, the t typically the competition at the shows that are not national qualifiers is, uh, you know, not quite as, as high quality because it is, you know, typically like newer competitors or competitors that are not necessarily looking to qualify or maybe not confident that they would a national qualifier. And so you're not going to see as, you know, as competitive or, uh, you know, high caliber of competition at those. But the national shows or national level shows, those also can vary, you know, competition wise, depending on what state you're in, what time of year, the reputation of the show, things like that. So uh, within those shows, <clears throat> you have several different divisions um, or different, um, of course, divisions. You're going to have, you know, men's physique and bikini and bodybuilding and, and the, all those things. Most regional shows at the amateur level have you know, all the classes, um, you know, some, some have fitness, some don't, um, but that's about the only one that, you know, may or may not be included. Um, uh, women's bodybuilding is also sometimes not included. Um, but anyway, so if you do one of those shows to qualify, um, some of those can actually even be, uh, you know, exclusive to a certain state, you know, if it's a state show, uh, some state shows even allow competitors from other places. Um, you know, so that doesn't necessarily mean, anything either um, you know they might have different classes uh, as far as like specific states um, you know this is the state champion or even like a regional show like the Knox Classic has a Mr. Knoxville Miss Knoxville in each division and so you know you're if you're within a certain radius of that then you can you know win that that uh, title but anyway so they have also classes for brand new competitors um, which is going to be true novice um, you can only do that one time doesn't matter if you change divisions doesn't matter if you didn't win or, you know, whatever it is, you can only do true novice one time. Um, in that show, you can do it in all of the classes that you're doing. Um, you know, say if somebody's doing men's physique and classic physique, you can do true novice in both, um, because it is your first show. Uh, but then after that, you're no longer allowed to do true novice, no matter how well you do. Uh, there's also novice. Um, I'm a little bit unclear on what constitutes this other than, um, you can't have one, I think it's your class in an open show or the novice overall, um, but don't quote me for sure on that. But I just know that there are novice divisions for people who have not won um, you know, their open class or uh, like I said, I think it's, it's the novice overall. So um, it may be the novice class, but I think it's the overall. So anyway, you um, can do those, you know, those classes as you're eligible for them. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the open is going to be open to anyone. There are also master's classes. And these start out with age, you know, age based, obviously, and usually it's 35 and up. And then it goes in like increments of 10. So like 35 and then 40 and then 50 and 60 and so on. Um, so, you know, that those exist as well. Um, as far as qualifying on those, um, those will qualify you for, a master's national show, such as Masters Nationals, Masters USA's, the Universe has a master's component as well as North Americans has a master's component. And so to qualify for those master's shows, all you have to do is have competed in a master's class at a regional show. Um, it doesn't matter how you place, you just have to have competed in it to go do master's nationals uh, or a national show in the master's uh, you know, classes. And so once you are qualified, um, then you can go do a national show. The, to get qualified, you have to be top two in your open class or, you know, like I said, masters is, is, is what it is. And so once you're qualified, um, then you can go on to do a national show. And depending on what division you're in and what national show you're doing, 
that is that determines how you turn pro. So like, uh, you know, for example, in bodybuilding at Junior USA's Junior Nationals, there are no pro cards given, uh, but USA's gives pro cards to the or to the class winner. Um, when you go to North Americans, it's top half of the overall in bodybuilding, but in the other classes, it's like top two in certain classes. Um, and then sometimes it's like the overall, or it's the, sometimes it's class winners, you know, that's all on the NPC website somewhere, I believe. Um, and if, if you can't find it there, what I usually have to do is go look at the previous year's winners and it tells you who won pro cards and then you can break down, you know, what they gave. So whether it was top two in each class or whatever. Um, and so that's how you turn pro. There are also other shows that are pro qualifiers in other countries, things like that. Um, you can do like the Olympia amateur and I believe it's like top half of the overall, uh, is going to be the, the pro card winners. The Arnold uh, amateur is overall winners gets pro get pro cards and things like that. But that's, that's pretty much the gist of all that. And so I just want to give a quick rundown on how that works for any new competitors, um, especially the one that asked me. So, <clears throat> so there's that. And then, so the next thing I want to talk about, um, is some training stuff. This is going to be the majority of this video. So I was watching the Real Bodybuilding podcast um, actually today, um, and they were discussing, you know, optimal training, what that looks like, and you know, as they often do, because there are different people on there that come on and talk about different training styles and preferences and things like that. So I kind of want to address some of the things they were arguing about and just some general concepts, uh, you know, within training and, and what makes good training and how to progress and that sort of thing. So. I want to define some of the training variables first. Um, so <clears throat> first of all, you have, um, you know, volume and for our, our purposes, we're going to call that reps times sets times weight lifted. Um, and that's your total volume. Um, there's different ways to just to, to define that, but just for what I'm talking about, just know that's what I mean. Some people will only talk about like set number and that kind of thing. And that's fine as long as you know exactly what you're, you know, to what you're referring. So volume is basically the, the total amount of training in some, in some way. Um, and so the, uh, you know, something else you can talk about is intensity. Um, if you go look at a textbook, in, you know, or a, a strength and conditioning book, textbook or study guide to the <coughs> exam for strength and conditioning or, or something like that, <coughs> you're going to see that intensity is going to be weight lifted so amount you know closest uh to your one one rep max for our purposes and for the bodybuilding world and bro science and that sort of thing that's not what we mean by intensity that is the textbook definition but that's not what we're saying what we're talking about with intensity is going to be typically proximity to failure um you know how how short your rest periods are you know in in reference to how hard you're or how heavy you're lifting and how much you know that sort of thing. But the main thing that is going to be proximity to failure. That's, that's sort of the, the accepted definition of, of intensity in our world and in, in bodybuilding. So for our purposes, that's what we're going to use. So proximity to failure. Um, and so that's something we can, we can discuss. And then uh, frequency, that's going to be how often you train a muscle group uh, or how often you train uh, period, you know, mostly, you know, mostly it's going to be the muscle groups um, because in bodybuilding we break down each muscle group and then so like you know frequency is going to be okay i train arms three times a week that is a you know that's the frequency of my arm training you know or, or like whatever it may be leg training whatever so that's what we mean by frequency is how often you're training a muscle group and typically these things are broken down in a week uh you know week week long cycle or they can be broken down into you know like a nine day you know training cycle that sort of thing um so it just kind of depends on how you, you know, you split up your training and break it down that way. But frequency is just how often you train something. That's the simple, simple breakdown on that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Duration typically is how long you're in the gym, you know, and that that's going to be made up of all the other things that you're doing. And then rest periods are obviously how long you're resting in between sets. And so those are, you know, that something else that you can, you know, definitely uh, adjust. Yeah, depending on you know your your goals and that sort of thing. So, um, so that's how we define those things. So, 
you know, what I want to actually get into a little bit is like training styles, um, you know, and, and specifically what they were talking about on that podcast. And so I've kind of explained that first of all. So they were, they were, um, contrasting two different training styles. One is your typical, um, you know, old school four sets of 10 type training, 45 seconds to a minute, uh, blood, you know, trying to get a good pump, that kind of thing. So that's, that's one way. Um, and then the other was, you know, sort of the newer school type of training where you, you know, progress up to a, a top set, you know, where you're not using up a lot of energy working up to that. And you do maybe one working set, um, you know, and then maybe one back off set or just one working set. And so, you know, those are two different styles of training, if you will, but there are similarities between the two and, and differences and, and things that really matter. And they also were discussing things like form and, and individual differences, you know, within technique and that sort of thing. So I guess I don't want to just randomly kind of talk. So I want to break this down into different, different pieces. So individual differences, I'm making some notes here, so I don't lose my train of thought. So what I want to talk about first is the individual differences within training, uh, you know, technique and execution, you know, among exercises and that sort of thing. So there are differences between how people train as far as the movements and how those movements are going to look and how they're going to engage different muscle groups and foot placement on different things like leg press or squats, different hand placements and arm paths and things like that. The only reason those are different though, is because people have genetic makeup, uh, that is different, uh, different lever lengths, different, uh, you know, muscle sizes, different, different heights and things like that. And so what happens is it might look different from one person to the next, but ultimately the same things are happening. So, you know, if one thing they discussed was like, if you have somebody doing a leg press that has, you know, really big legs, but their legs seem like they could, their feet or foot placement is a little bit high. And if you, you know, would you go up to that person and say, Hey, you know, I know you got big legs, but you need to change how you leg press, you know? And, and, and the answer to that is, first of all, I wouldn't go up to anybody in the gym period, you know, unless they were going to hurt themselves. Maybe even then, uh, you know, if they didn't, would didn't handle it well, I'd probably just leave them alone. But the point was, would you correct that person? And absolutely. Um, you know, if they were asking for it, if it was my client or whatever, and you can always make something a little bit better, even if you are Mr. Olympia and you have perfect, you know, or seemingly perfect, you know, proportions and things. Because the main thing that matters is, are you training the muscle that you're trying to train? Just because someone has a great, you know, great legs or great arms doesn't mean they train perfectly in those, you know, the, the movements that work those muscles. And so, yes, there are individual differences. Like, for example, I have to put my feet outward a little bit because I have immobile hips and things like that. And I've got long femurs. And so in order to get good depth, you know, on like a, uh, a leg press or, you know, if I did a barbell squat, I would have to put out, you know, have a pretty wide stance. And so, you know, someone like me versus someone like Sean Clarita, maybe, you know, our squats are going to look a lot different, but we're still going to be trying to do the same things, which is pressing our, you know, driving our knees out, keeping our, keeping them tracking over the toes, um, you know, stimulating the quads, uh, you know, the, in that way pushing out through our, you know, through the balls of our feet versus like the heels and, and, and that kind of thing. So getting there is going to look a little bit different based on body structure and body shape, but the foundations of biomechanics and, you know, the way muscles are, are, or, or originate and insert, you know, that doesn't change other than just maybe distances and angles and things like that. A quadricep is still a quadricep, even if it's a little bit shorter or longer and that kind of thing. So, there are some, some basic things that we can't ignore when it comes to training. You know, there are certain tech principles of, of technique that are, that are going to be the safest and the most effective, you know, but again, those look a little bit different from person to person. So that's where the individual differences come along when it comes to form, uh, you know, and that kind of thing, but rep execution is non-negotiable. So we have to, you know, move, weight in a way that is contracting the muscles we're trying to grow. Um, and so that's, that's not negotiable either. So, you know, there may be one person, somebody, you know, if you look at somebody like Branch Warren, the way he used to train, yes, he was, you know, a little bit haphazard with, with how the weight moved and everything, but he felt the muscles and he used those muscles. And so, you know, if somebody trains that way, 
and their joints can handle it, then that's fine. That, you know, it, it's probably not, it, most people can't handle that. Most people's joints and nervous systems can't handle training that way, you know, and so I don't advise that. But if you are stimulating the muscle, then that's what really matters. And you're not, you know, putting your joints in a bad place and that's what matters. You know, there, I'll, I'll kind of give a quick background on the science. There, there are three potential ways to grow muscle or, or stimulate muscle protein synthesis. One is mechanical tension, and that's literally just moving weight, you know, or putting force on the muscles, you know, uh, putting gravity uh, on the muscles and actually moving weight or not. You know, if you're contracting a muscle against against a, an opposition, whether it's isometric, like you're doing a plank or something, or whether it's actually moving the weight, um, that's uh, mechanical tension. The other one is metabolic stress. Um, or one of the other ones is metabolic stress. That's going to be your metabolite buildups like um, lactic acid and, you know, blood into the muscles and the pump and those kind of things. And the other one's going to be muscle damage, you know. So if you're doing like a negative on a hack squat and you're really, really sore, um, you know, from that, that's muscle damage. That one's debatable whether it actually causes growth. And, and we know for sure that a lot of it can actually, you know, impede muscle growth. Okay. And so the... <clears throat> the things that have to happen are mechanical tension for sure, metabolic stress, maybe, and, you know, possibly or not, um, muscle damage. And so if you are loading up a muscle and we know that training close to failure is what stimulates muscle protein synthesis, then that's how we grow muscles. Okay. And so, you know, there, there have been some studies done recently, uh, Brad Schoenfeld has talked about you can train with light loads as long as it's near muscle failure um, or mechanical muscle failure, which just means form starting to break down because your you know your muscles are too fatigued to keep going properly. Then you know we know that it doesn't have to be sets of six. It, ha it doesn't have to be sets of eight to twelve. I think uh, this this is I'm pulling this out of the sky, but I think around thirty was the top of where. Um, you know, that landed as far as stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Um, but ultimately it's about a, a, an effort threshold, uh, is what I believe they were saying. So, you know, even above that 30 range, that's not a hard and fast rule, even if that is the right number. Um, but basically you can grow as long as there's, you know, you're challenging the muscle and none of those are exclusive. Um, when you have, uh, when you have um, mechanical tension and you do a few repetitions, you have the mechanical tension, but you're also going to end up have, having some metabolite buildup. Even if you do a set of 30, you're still putting tension on the muscles. There's just going to be more metabolite buildup than if you're doing a set of five or six. So they're all working in together. Um, I actually had a client today ask me if it's if it's good to, to separate those per session. And that's one way to do it, right? Like you can have a you know, like a pump session at the end of the week, you know, and that's going to be easy on the nervous system and you can have like a, a heavier load uh, session earlier in the week and that sort of thing. Um, typically what I like to do is, is combine them in one session and, and mostly that's going to be based on each exercise. So in the beginning of the session, I like to do some of the heavier stuff that's more mechanical tension focused uh, and then move on toward the metabolic stress uh, type stuff toward the end of the session. And I think that's a pretty common way to do things. And, you know, it's a lot of times a safer way to do things because toward the end of the session, you're getting a little fatigued and that sort of thing. And so, you know, that can be a good way to, to set up your programming. So ultimately, you know, I don't want to sit here and ramble on forever and ever, but, you know, the main things that we need are stimulating muscles and recovery. And so, you know, a lot of that, as far as, you know, volume, heavy versus light, short rest versus long rest, a lot of that's going to, going to point toward recovery, right? So like if you, you know, if you're doing high volume and high intensity, your recovery is not going to be very good. And so you're not going to be able to do that with high frequency. And if you do, you're going to end up being overtrained. And so you have to, to pick which levers to pull as far as your training. And part of that's going to be whether you, you know, what do you enjoy? Do you enjoy training with little rest period, getting, you know, lots of pumps? Um, or do you enjoy, um, uh, you know, taking a long time between sets, making sure that you're going heavy between each set, you know, and that sort of thing. Now, the caveat with that is if you're doing more weight per set, that is probably going to lead to more muscle growth because you are 
um, you're getting a lot of uh, mechanical tension there. So that is one reason why I will, you know, have a lot of people scale back on, you know, how the, the pace of their training when they start working with me, because I want them to get a little more weight lifted each set, um, you know, obviously with good form, you know, the entire time. And so that is something else to consider, you know, how much weight are you able to lift from set to set? The other thing with that is how much time do you have to train? You know, some of people, some people have day jobs and kids and things like that. And so, yeah, maybe you do need to train at a faster pace to try to squeeze in more volume. And, and that is going to be a little bit safer potentially on the joints, you know, depending on, you know, how your body responds to that and how your joints feel, how old you are and those kind of things. So it, a lot of this is going to be about figuring out what works for you. Um, you know, which is one of the things I talked about a lot on that podcast, but the other thing, you have to consider is there are certain absolutes, you know, mechanical tension is non-negotiable. And so, you know, you have to figure out how to get the most of that while still recovering and spending a reasonable amount of time in the gym. And so, you know, there's some, some basic principles that we've all, you know, sort of adopted with, you know, setting up training sessions. Um, you know, one of the other debates that's really big right now is, is, you know, logbook versus kind of the pump training, the, the, you know, intensity, the hot, the, the hot, I don't even, I don't like the way they use, you know, the term high intensity because, you know, if you're doing short rest periods and training, you know, um, with a lot of volume and, and a lot of sets, then, you know, that that's pretty intense. So the intensity thing sort of gets lost and all that. But, but what I mean is, uh, you know, if you're doing the one set logging the weight you lift, and then next week, trying to log, trying to lift a little bit more, and that's you know within that same rep range, you know it's whatever that versus you know sort of randomly lifting X number of sets with so much weight, you know, with little rest period and just whatever. That you know the the, the differences between those two, and sort of the argument against the second one is you can't log or you can't measure your progress in the gym, and that is true to an extent. So. The, the, I'll talk about progressive overload now, and then I'll kind of get into that. So progressive overload simply just means doing more than you did before. Okay. And that doesn't have to be weight lifted. Um, it can be a faster pace, less rest time. It can be better form, you know, better muscle recruitment, more intention with each rep. You're, if you're progressing and getting better at each movement, that's progression. You know, that's still progressive overload because you're overloading the muscles better each week or whatever or how, you know, whatever the, the breakdown is. So it can also be more sets. If you add in a set of, you know, if you're doing three sets of 10 on curls and you add in a fourth set of 10, that's progressive overload. That's 10 extra reps and one extra set that you did. That's progressive overload. Now, can you progressively overload your sets week after week forever? No, because you'll end up doing a hundred sets, you know, on one exercise and that's not reasonable at all. So we lift more weight each week. That's one way to progressively overload. And that's what most people think of. So just, you know, as, as a background there on progressive overload, you know, a lot of people don't, don't consider some of the other variables that you can progress. And that, like I said, you know, those are some of those I just listed. So the thing is with the two different styles of training, you know, whether it's like a high volume or whether it's the logbook style where you're, you know, doing the one set or whatever, the, the, the theme um, should for both of them be, are you progressing? And, you know, the old school style of training, you're, and I used to train like this, you're still progressing or you're trying to, that's the goal. You know, each week, you know, you don't usually write these things down, but when you train, you can kind of remember what you lifted. You know, if you're bench pressing, you know, you did 225 or, you know, you did, you know, okay, I put a 10 on each side last week. So let's throw a five on this week or whatever. So, you know what you did for your four sets of 10 or whatever your program says. So, you know, that the next week you need to do a little bit more. Now, just because you don't write that down on a, you know, on a notebook with, with like the, the people in the gym that I used to be one of, um, you know, just because you don't write it down in a notebook or, or type it into your Excel spreadsheet, it doesn't mean you're not progressing. It doesn't mean that you didn't do a couple of extra reps on that last set, you know, whether that was a drop set or a cluster or whatever that may be. It doesn't mean you didn't do extra. It just means that it's a little bit harder to quantify because you don't have it written down and you don't have a specific log book and a, and a goal for progression each week. And that may be okay. Um, and I still, you know, I still don't log everything every, or I don't really log much anymore at all because I have a very consistent training plan. I have a, I go to the same gym 
uh, for each training uh, training day. Um, I have a, a gym I like to go to for legs. I have places I like to go to for delts. And I know from week to week what I did the week before. You know, either my training partner or I or whoever it is, you know, we know what we did the week before. And so we know this week, okay, you know, we're going to try to do another rep within this, you know, eight to 12 range that we were, we're failing in, or we're going to, you know, we've got three sets of 10 this week and we're going to progressively, you know, work up to one top set, one heavy set. Well, I know that I did, you know, if it's a shoulder press, I know I did three sets of, uh, or I did like my top set last week was a, you know, a four plate. And so this week I know that I need to add five or a 10 or whatever. Um, and that's the same, you know, with either style, you just either you log it or you don't, but most of us remember what we did and we try to do a little bit more. So progressive overload is still being applied. You know, people are, people will say the term like, oh, I do a progressive overload style of training. Well, good. We all do, hopefully, because if you're not progressing each week, then you're not growing. You're not changing. You're not challenging your body above what it was challenged last time. I and mean, that's how you stop growing. And so it doesn't matter how you get there. The important thing is that you are stimulating the muscle, recovering, well, stimulating the muscle safely and recovering and then progressing. Those are really the only things that matter. Okay. If you need to adjust the form to, to challenge the appropriate muscles, adjust the form. If you need to adjust, you know, intent with each movement. And what I mean by that is, you know, are you swinging the weight? Are you managing your tempo to where you, you know, control the concentric and eccentric, the, the, the push and the, and the, the negative or whatever that looks like. Are you managing those things to where the muscles are getting maximally stimulated? That's what's important. And whether you log it in a book, whether you put it on an Excel spreadsheet, whatever, it doesn't matter. I love the, I love this, the spreadsheet model and or the, you know, the logbook model. I have, you know, most of my clients, I have, you know, I have them log their weights each week because I can look at that and see if they're progressing. And that can give me an idea if I need to back their training down or give them a rest, an extra rest day or do a deload or whatever. And so the logbook thing is awesome because it gives you tangible numbers and tangible, you know, metrics that you can go by. And so you can adjust things as needed and you know, if you're progressing or not. Um, and so I still think that's awesome. Um, but I also think there are certain movements and certain styles of training and certain periods of time where it's cool to just go in the gym and just bust out as much as you can within a certain framework. And, and then the next week, try to do a little bit more, you know, whether it looks like, whether you write that down or whether you don't, you, you're, you're progressing. So the biggest thing, you know, the biggest takeaway here, I guess in summary, is just, again, are you stimulating the muscle safely? Are you able to recover, you know, within the time for time frame needed to do your next training session? Uh, and then are you progressing? And then as far as training, that's really the only thing that matters, right? And there's, there's nuances and ways you can design training programs, ways you can progress them, ways you can periodize them, all of those things. And those are great things and they should absolutely all be used. But if it doesn't come back to those four things, you're not really, you know, you're not really doing anything. So hopefully all that made sense. Um, I didn't really have exactly a, a, a table of contents or a, whatever that I want that I was working with here, but I just had some thoughts I wanted to get out. And so hopefully, you know, some of that stuff uh, resonates with you guys. And um, I hope that you'll comment below or ask me any questions. If I said anything that was wrong, feel free to correct me. If you have any, you know, anything you want, um, want me to follow up or clarify on, please feel free to, uh, to let me know. Um, I'm hoping to do a lot more of these. Uh, Anna got me this microphone, so I'm hooked up here and um, uh, starting the aftermath, uh, training podcast on Friday with Alex. So looking forward to that. So if you guys have any topics for that, let me know. Um, trying to get some more content out on Instagram as well and everything. So, so, um, if you guys don't mind, just give me some ideas and, um, and I'll be happy to deliver. And, um, thank you again for watching. And I hope that this was at least somewhat logical for you guys. Talk to you next time.